Hello everyone. Thank you for attending this webinar on building GPT apps on Salesforce. And over the next 45 minutes, we're going to cover a range of AI applications, everything from simple language translation use cases to more sophisticated chatbots, AI assistants, bringing a chat GPT type of experience into Salesforce. We are going to cover file GPT. This allows us to chat with PDFs, images, variety of documents. We are going to explore customer facing chatbots. So this case, uh, it's a chatbot that is assisting with a quote. Uh, looks good. I may need help with installation. So this particular bot is trained on upsell, cross-sell, knows various add-on products that might be available. And we're going to explore the use of Salesforce flows as the backplane, the underlying glue to all of this that does all of the orchestration with uh, GPT and AI. So first I want to start, um, for me personally, this quote best captures the current state of AI and, and GPT in 2023. It's from Bill Gates, uh, founder CEO of Microsoft in his book, The Road Ahead. He says, we always overestimate the change that will occur in the next two years and underestimate the change that will occur in the next 10. And that just perfectly describes where we're at today. If we were to map where we're at with generative AI on, let's say the Gartner hype cycle, we're, we're getting right into what they call the peak of inflated expectations, which means that over the next two years, we're going to, um, we're going to try a lot of things. There's going to be a lot of ideas. There's going to be a lot of, um, Honestly, people trying to figure out their careers and their company and their strategy in this space. And then within about five to 10 years, maybe half of those ideas, we won't be talking about them anymore. And we'll go into sort of a trough of disillusionment. And then steadily over time, we're gonna realize this is the real deal. Now, some technologies actually don't emerge out of this trough of disillusionment. The reason I'm showing this chart is that absolutely uh, as you've seen in prior presentations, um, this is a generational, uh, once in a generation type of breakthrough. It's, it's, it's very huge. And over the next 10 years, we're gonna emerge into gradually more productivity. Um, but a lot of things within a couple years, uh, things like LLMs, uh, large language models, these things are gonna get so baked into the stack that we just won't be worrying about them anymore. They're gonna be implied that any sort of AI is drawing upon dozens or hundreds of unique language models to serve its use cases. We're gonna have a lot more agents working asynchronously on our, our behalf. Um, we're not gonna be talking about the size of these data models any longer, uh, even according to the CEO of OpenAI. We've kind of reached peak LLM. I mean, there's only so much you need to do with a trillion parameter model. Um, there's only so many ways you can form the English languages and other languages in, in a series. But the next level we're going to grow into are our memory and, um, and actually just larger contextual type of models with injecting it with our own, in this case, injecting it with an entire Salesforce org on top of an LLM. But first, a few uh, quick disclosures. The solution presented here makes exclusive use of the OpenAI Enterprise API. We have received grants and credits from Microsoft Azure and OpenAI to develop GPT solutions. And any forward-looking or roadmap statements are in part based on OpenAI's and Microsoft's ability to deliver some stated features. And the application presented, iDialog, can be found on the App Exchange. So, a quick note on iDialog basically, our mission is one to one dialogues, personalized interactions with customers. And typically, we want to use more asynchronous, event based internet technologies. 
an always on 24 seven grid that is always interacting on your behalf or directly with customers. And I've personally been in the Salesforce ecosystem as, as Mark kind of alluded to in the intro for um, many years. Um, I helped found the Salesforce team at Facebook. We worked on a lot of personalized um, enterprise ads and um, marketing. And, but with iDialog in 2019, we started with document generation rooms and landing pages. These were just the, the most personalized one-to-one -one pieces of content at the time. Most commonly in sales quotes, invoices, and orders. In 2020, we started getting into more machine learning and AI. We added document and image text extraction, um, e-signature. That evolved into identifying personally identifiable information and semantic analysis of documents. Then last year was the big kind of groundbreaking aha moment for us. We can achieve one-to-one -one personalized interactions through GPT. And so we immediately adopted actually GP2 and 3 and that sort of transition. We added just simple completions. There was no chat and um, and file GPT. Since we're very document based, we started initially with on like PDF chat type of applications. Then this year we've evolved that and we've grown with OpenAI as a partner. We've added GP, GPT AI assistance and chatbots. So Many people on, on this webinar are Salesforce professionals. You might be an administrator, you might be a Salesforce developer, you might be a business analyst or a manager, and you're asking yourself, hey, where is this going? Uh, you know, what is my job going to look like in the future with AI? My personal core belief is AI will serve us. You need to manage it in a way and that AI is serving us and not the other way. We're not, we're not serving AI. I think a lot of the, every single job description and job title remains the same, except within the roles and responsibilities, there's always going to be this asterisk of proficiency with AI, proficiency with prompts, prompt engineering. Just like we say, hey, do you have proficiency with word processors and spreadsheets? It's just going to become a normal tool set in our day-to-day -day job and everyone will be assumed to have some capability with it. You'll, you'll, inevitably, everyone will be chatting with documents, spreadsheets, and legal files. The biggest change, however, if I were to sit down with your team today and help align you for the next five years and guarantee your success with AI, the two jobs I would focus on the most would be business analyst and an AI flow developer. And the great thing about being a, a business analyst or a BA and going forward is that BAs will continue to interact with clients. They'll understand the requirements and they will draft up requirements in human natural language without, before any quoting. I mean, we'll get down to the details. And you sit down with the VP of sales or whoever it is, and they will get down into very nuanced requirements such as, you know, the SLA bronze product is not available in Alaska. The shipping and handling, the costs exceed there. They have to be an SLA platinum. And so every rule from discounting, bundle rules, configuration, price, quoting, they all become the new source code. And with a little bit of change to that, there's, there's a preamble so at the very beginning, there were our requirements were actually contextualizing an AI assistant, act as an expert sales coach, act as a customer service agent, and tell them what they are doing. You are supporting a sales representative. You are supporting an end customer. And by inserting this in a natural language, we're giving an AI assistant some context on how it should behave any responses to questions will be based on everything that's in here. Does this replace validation rules? Does it replace um, workflow rules? Yes, absolutely. When we get into GPT-4 and even in the GPT-5, their logic and reasoning far exceeds anything we 99% of humans can do in our own programming. Now, the reason I mentioned there are two job descriptions is the BA will write the, re the requirements 
They will typically write it in some sort of FAQ, frequently asked questions format, but they will insert into the document, actual quote details go here, actual quote products go here, the primary contact goes here. And this is where prompt engineering comes into play because you still need to understand conditional branching. Um, you still need to understand concepts such as iterators and looping over collections. And that's where we go from a generic, just pure text-based prompt and we cross into the art and science of prompts in data structures and version control and approval processes and that becomes engineering. So GPT started around seven or eight years ago out of Google with TensorFlow, neural networks, a lot of those kind of covered in previous sessions. And just in the last 12 to 24 months, we've seen a proliferation of different types of apps. Fundamentally, there are GPT completions that, that are the building blocks of GPT. And then you get into GPT training, flow orchestration, dialogue, chat-based applications file applications, Apex GPT, and if time allows, we'll get into some semantic search in a new type of database called a vector database. And this necessarily has brought about its own stack. So GPT, many stacks will evolve, but we, we primarily have one today built on uh, GPT. Very similar to in Salesforce, we have MVC, which is Model View Controller. And that is an acronym that basically says we have a, a data model or the database. We have controllers, the middleware, the triggers, the apex actions, the flow actions. And then we experience that data through views. That could be lightning web components, visual force, page layouts. In GPT, the stack, we start with uh, training sources, text and images. These are um, basically crawlers that have gone out in Wikipedia or in very specialized language models. They've only crawled on, say, um, a corpus of legal documents. Then the next layer above that, we have vectorized all this content um, that's used outside of the language model. This is content specific to our Salesforce org. So we're taking documents, org knowledge, um, and we're creating embeddings in a new technology or fairly new called a vector database. And then above that, what's highlighted in blue is this orchestration layer. So we're actually orchestrating and moving data around. We're calling GPT and various AIs. We're doing transformations in, through orchestration. And if that's all you did was build a flow-based app that works in the background, those are sufficient skills to get a functional app. Um, the value of GPT is it is a dialogue-based model. So we have this new concept within the stack called a dialogue layer. And within this layer, we're managing the conversation history, memory management. It understands the, the intent and the semantics of what the user wants, and it's able to take intelligently take action based on that intent. And that is being delivered and consumed through traditional user experience, user interfaces, mobile desktop, email, SMS, as well as going forward into virtual uh, VR, um, AR, augmented reality, virtual reality. Um, let's talk a bit about security. I've, I've learned just through giving this presentation before, it's, it's best to talk about this sooner than just throw a slide in at the end. Um, Everyone justifiably has questions about security. It's new. There is a lot of outdated information, misinformation out there. Again, going back to our hype cycle that we're in, um, you need to have certain filters in place and do some due diligence and understand the security. And the fact is you have a security problem today. IT departments have a security problem today and they just actually don't know it. And what is, what is happening today is people are cut and pasting data from a page layout into ChatGPT. So for example, I'm just gonna grab some text here and really no, no effort at all, I'm not parsing it in any way, I'm just pasting it in. I'm gonna say write an intro email to the following lead uh, 
200 words or less. Paste, enter, boom, email. It's that fast. And what people are doing is they're actually pre-crafting some of these prompts, like create an email with emphasis on you know, certain products or you know, use this to introduce myself. And it's, it's very convenient and it's being used on, on every single record. So for example, we could open up an account record. If I wanna understand this account, again, I'm just a cut and paste away and a simple prompt to understand it. So I go in here, I say, summarize this account in Hindi. And it comes right back. So this is my, basically your Salesforce users are doing this today and it is a big, potentially big, big security problem. And OpenAI and a lot of these chat applications, you have to read their EULAs in the fine print because um, they may be using this data to retrain their model. So what do you do? I mean, what is the answer to this? The answer is pretty simple. You give them chat GPT and Salesforce. You create a pre-crafted prompts to write an in, uh, intro email to this lead. You pre-craft prompts to say, summarize this account in Hindi. And so they get these emails crafted directly in Salesforce and they get these translations and summarizations directly in Salesforce. And the big difference here is that there are completely different user license agreements between the consumer experience and the business experience. OpenAI is widely considered the best of breed language model. People want to use it for business use cases. However, they might be biased and thinking, oh, that's just the same thing of ChatGPT when actually it is not. It goes down its own path, completely firewalled, and we, we can inject it with any sort of data. And it is, it is not used, the system prompt is completely discarded and not used within training. However, the fine print within ChatGPT says that if you have conversation history retained, in other words, if, if users are saving their conversation history, then they reserve the right to repurpose that content and enhance the language model. So worst, worst case, someone comes along, another GPT user says, hey, how many employees are in Burlington? And GPT would just say, you know, I don't know, but you know, someone many months ago had a chat thread to this effect. I've seen these words and these were the results. And so that's where we get into, there is some urgency to simply bring a chat GPT urgency into your org today and to start enabling it within your enterprise systems. We're seeing this on Microsoft in Copilot. We're seeing this in Einstein GPT. We're seeing this in a number of, of categories of apps where they are bringing GPT experiences into the enterprise so it becomes the, the path of least resistance. And uh, in our case, we're in utilizing OpenAI. It is, it is hosted on Azure, uh, Microsoft's Azure, which has made a substantial investment in OpenAI, has access to the models, has their own hosting. Um, we are a Microsoft customer and partner, and they are adamant in their communication and how secure this is and how trustworthy it is in using their models. I highly recommend if you want to learn more uh, to go to the trust.openai portal. Um, a career in AI can be extremely lucrative. The compensation for someone who is versed in AI, either in the lower level infrastructure or more abstract applied. Um, if you are knowledgeable, every interview is going to ask, hey, do you understand GDPR? Do you understand SOC 2 and SOC 3? This information is available to you today. You can educate yourself, you can understand the models. If you are looking to bring GPT into your Salesforce org, you understandably are going to be asked questions from the CIO, the chief security officer. Educate yourself, be informed. Um, you can actually enter into your own DPA, your, your data processing agreements directly with OpenAI. I highly recommend you do that. 
Um, we have entered into an agreement. Um, this is publicly available, our, our data processing agreement. Uh, within our Flow GPT open source package, you can see actually the, our data, process, data processing agreement between Pacific Apps and OpenAI. Um, this is actually a good segue into our File GPT product, which is we're seeing the majority of early adoption in GPT by legal professionals in documents and simply asking it questions. What are the obligations of our company in this agreement? You know, what are the risk factors in this agreement? What are the obligations of the counterparty in this agreement? Who is the lessor and lessee? And, you know, this is a multi-page agreement, many thousands of um, words, but with the latest model of iDialogue GPT, we're able to quickly kind of distill our obligations. So I, un I understand I've these, um, I mean, I've, I've spent the time and read every word, but, but I would broadly want to communicate to the entire company of these bullet points is that, you know, we are, we are a data processor. We have to remain in compliance with data protection laws. And uh, we use file GPT to get an understanding of this. People also understandably coming from a chat GPT background want to understand just simple questions. Does OpenAI use customer data to train their AI models? You would want your lawyer to actually read these EULAs and understand it in detail. Uh, you could read it yourself, or you could also use ChatGPT, and it will tell you, you know, ChatGPT does not use it when utilized through the API. Okay, and finally, security professionals are using um, GPT today. Um, in fact, doing a code review of security settings. Um, we code review all of our metadata using ChatGPT. If we ever need to go into an unfamiliar org and we want to understand the password policies, yeah, we could spend a billable hour or two clicking around and understanding uh, the setup, but it's we can also, within about 10 seconds, just use one of our pre-canned prompts and against the security.settings file, we can ask it questions. Given the provided security.settings document, identify any potential security issues, risks, or concerns. And it will say, yeah, your minimum password length is eight. You know, we recommend it should be stronger. Uh, session settings, SSO, password policies. So all these recommendations, um, and, and you know, this is just a one paragraph. Um, we're going to be announcing uh, a metadata solution too, where you can, for each individual piece of metadata, have thousands of words and prompting, and just how you, as a consultant or a security professional, would expect the org state, the org shape to be when you approach an org. Um, and while we're on the topic of, of image processing, um, so Mark Good has created this um, very nice GPT dreaming website. I've taken a screenshot, I've uploaded it to Salesforce. And again, this is an image, there's, there's text in the image, but it's a PNG image. And GPT is now multimodal. There's um, an and with iDialog OCR and extraction. It's converted this image to um, text and you know, we can get some insights. Um, we can actually play with this text. We can convert the convert the session times to Eastern time zone and translate to Italian. So starting from an image, we can go through a series of transformations, first into text and chunking, and then we go into it has semantic understanding of, oh, these are times, these are time zones, um, and these are sessions, and it's able to do the translation. Okay, so the fundamental building block of GPT is the completion. And so this is all about 
one input and one output. So an input would be write a poem about dogs and the output would be sure thing, here's a poem about dogs. And with no grounding or any sort of training or engineering, you're really at liberty of whatever the model is going to produce. And it will gladly give you any sort of outcome, which is why we have this whole kind of practice of um, GPT engineering. So an example of um, a case of completion. So let's pull up one of our sample cases here. I'm going to translate uh, hello world to Spanish. I get uh, hola mundo. I'm going to translate hola mundo to Italian. Ciao mundo. I'm going to translate that to uh, kanji. Yeah, we get some Japanese symbolic representation. And then I'm going to go back from Japanese to English. Normally, this type of telephone pole translation is uh, a pretty scary kind of demo to do. We, we can see here, after all these translations, we're back to Hello World. And um, it's just the GPT is very, very good at symbolic representation. And that would be an example of translation is, is one example. Um, there is uh, semantic understanding, sentiment analysis, categorization. There's a number of use cases. Pretty soon, just doing a series of one-off completions gets boring. You need more complexity in the enterprise and business use cases. We need to do orchestration. And so right after GPT-3 launched, there was actually a, an open source project, LangChain, that emerged that saw a lot of uptake. Um, we looked at it internally for our document use cases. You are extracting text, chunking, embedding, vectorizing. And you necessarily need um, an automation tool to drag and drop and do these quickly. Uh, another great solution has emerged, Grip Tape. Uh, the founders have um, um, their former Salesforce implementers, um, AWS, a um, lot of expertise there, Microsoft Flow. So we, we looked at it, we considered building our own, we considered um, using open source. Ultimately, we made Salesforce Flow work for our orchestration needs. And an example of a flow you can see here, one of these tabs. So we have a flow that, um, that has those four transformations. Uh, initially, it, it summarizes a case. So we can open this up. We have an input, which is a system prompt defined in a variable. And that contains a lot of case details. We're saying summarize this case in 100 words. And we have an output. So we're manually assigning it to the out, uh, summary response. Then we're going to translate that into any language, in this case, Spanish. So we have an input, which is our summary. And we're saying, you are a language translator. Translate to the following. Then we get an output, AI translation response. Then we're going to do something a little more sophisticated. We're going to open an FAQ. And a, a frequently asked question document is a perfect example of what you would call a few shot prompt. You're training an AI basically to say, here is a question, here is the best answer. Here is another question, here is another answer. An AI loves to consume either an FAQ or a chain of thought, but it just needs to be grounded and seeded in many examples. And it will answer precisely if you also uh, additionally add to that, you know, stick to the script, stick to this FAQ. And finally, if there are some comments on the case, we're going to loop through each one. We're going to build up a prompt that does a sentiment analysis. So we're asking, we're doing a simple completion, one input, one output. Here's the input. Here are all the case comments. And we're saying classify this as positive, neutral, or negative. And then we're getting back a customer sentiment. So I think I can go ahead and run this again. It's already been run. but. Um, we're getting a um, internet seems pretty good today or the API. So when a record is updated, 
this particular case is asking about what kind of oil should I use and trigger it to run. So again, we're doing a series of four callouts to the API. We have some conditional branching. Do we have comments? We're doing iteration over collections. So these are engineering type practices. And on the right hand side, the, the greatest thing about using Salesforce Flow is that it's um, there's a lot of transparency. You can see the inputs. You are customer service, um, support case analyst, here's the input, here's the summary as an output. We get in the translation, here's the input, we get Espanol as the output. We get into an FAQ prediction, and notice here we didn't need to dump the entire FAQ text into the system context. Uh, through the iDialog API, we just give it a pointer, a reference to a content version. We're saying, here's a document, here's a link to uh, an existing document, and you sh should answer this person's question uh, based on this FAQ. So based on the case details and FAQ, provide the best suggested resolution in less than 100 words, be concise. And it was an oil-based question, so it correctly chose the, here's the recommended oil type. And then finally, we do some sentiment analysis. We can see one of the customer's inputs is, um, hey, this is frustrating. I'm not sure if the, the instructions on page two refer to my generator. And the sentiment analysis comes back as negative. So all this is kind of accretive uh, to the record. Um, this all happens within about four or five seconds. And on the case page layout, we can see now that we have an AI summary. We have a translated summary. We have a suggested resolution and we have a negative ana uh, sentiment analysis. So a service representative at this point would be able to kind of run with this and email call. They'd have a pretty good idea of a suggested resolution. Or additionally, we could take the next step um, in the flow, we could actually generate a link to what we call a, a room. And we could, if we've trained this model and, and we've grounded it on the FAQ, we could just simply send out an autoresponder from a web to case. You know, sorry, you're having an issue. Click here. Uh, we think we have a solution for you. And so here we have an AI assistant is asking, hey, does the suggested resolution resolve your question? You could, you know, the customer, yes. You know, that answers my question. But you know, while I have you online, I have a question about gasoline. So, um, you know, the ethics aside of whether or not you're representing an avatar based or a human kind of chatbot, the response is very human like. That is, that is the important thing. And so, you know, the customer can interact. Um, you know, what type of gasoline should I use? Again, this bot is going back to the PDF, the FAQ finds the right question for your particular generator, you're going to want this one. So it even knows it's a Genwatt 300. I'm not sure how it knows that. I'll ask it, like, you know, what products have I, I purchased? And so this bot is also grounded in the entitlements. It knows the order history, it knows the quote history, it knows everything about the customer. You know, you could ask it, you know, what is my email address? And it's highly personalized and can uh, steer and align the conversations one-to-one, -one, very personalized to the customer's interactions. Which is a good segue into chat applications and AI assistance. You just saw the Support case, use case, um, if we were to play around with, um, let's go to a quote. And so we've interacted with, with this quote advisor and asked it, you know, does this quote require, require approval? And it's come back and says, yeah, this, this requires approval. 
and you know what exactly you can say you know itemize your required add-on products in markdown format let's just say and so from an upsell and cross-sell perspective this this bot understands has a basic understanding of some CPQ rules, and it's saying, "Hey, for you, you're going to have to add a particular SLA. You're going to have to add at least one installation product, low, medium, or high." Um, and for all I know, you know, this pro this customer might be in Alaska, and you saw earlier we have a rule. Um, we could ask, you know, is the SLA bronze product supported for this customer like I didn't check the account so I'm just kind of guessing here but um, well it's saying no the SLA is not supported for this customer so there there does not necessarily need to be one chat bot there can actually be many what Salesforce did for custom tabs and custom objects you can also do for GPT with a lot of custom GPT. And, and similar to the case, uh, this chatbot is constantly driving towards a um, closing a deal and you can actually deploy a variety of GPT assistants. There is a sales facing assistant uh, in this case, there is um, there is an assistant in the room that's helping the customer. So uh, the customer here might say, "Hey, this sounds good. Um, I may need help with installation." The customer actually, um, the, the chatbot actually knows there's a range of installation products and is offering to help with uh, upselling on the installation. In fact, I should be able to just be able to ask here, you know, what installation services and products are available and how much do they cost? And so the, the AI assistant now is actually able to provide a, a quote at a high level and add those items and notify the sales rep that the customer is requesting additional items. So the, the flow to actually make this work is where we get into um, GPT engineering. Go ahead and open this up. And similar to the case flow, we have a uh, opportunity based flow. Everything really starts with the system prompt template. So we've taken the, the business analyst document and literally it's mostly a cut and paste, but we've, uh, of all their particular rules, but we've broken it down. We've done the right thing as an engineer is that we have a particular variable in source for discounting rules. And we might delegate the ownership of those rules to somebody in sales or finance. Uh, SLA products and installation, we might delegate ownership of that to the service side of the, of the company. Product rules and approval rules, maybe marketing it owns the bundling options and pricing and VP of sales owns the approval rules. And in line here, we are injecting into on a per opportunity basis, the specific context of the quote and the products and uh, we're also injecting the sales methodology which which goes in here and for alignment purposes we have access to uh, dialogue is a first class object within the system it's basically a transcript of everything that's transpired and both internal sales and external customer facing and when we see these these prompts expanded yeah well sorry that is a that was the file there we go given the all right let's do an actual interaction here with this thing talking OK, 
Okay, AI assistant does this with prior approval. Um, let's ask it uh, what upsell and cross sell opportunities are suggested. Um, we're using this neat sales methodology, NEAT. That's another one that this can give answers for. Um, you know, what is our, our selling method? This is great for onboarding and enablement for new sales reps. Um, you can actually do an if statement to determine how long someone's been employed. If they've been sales rep for less than six months, maybe you inject more or less of the methodology. Okay, so now if we go back to our dialogues, uh, we now have a transcript of this particular dialogue. Open the transcript. So we have the, the text from the BA, act, act as an expert, quote rules, the various service level products. But then we get into the details of the actual customer account is in the, in the prompt. The actual quote deals are in the prompt. The actual or quote details, the quote products, uh, the primary contract, uh, price book, etc. So we've talked a little bit about customer facing chat bots. Uh, it really is, we, we have reached the, the ultimate stage of one to one personalized experience. I mean, what CRM was founded on customer relationship and managing that relationship. And nothing really changes as far as a system of record. You need to know who are your customers and you need to know at a very quantifiable level, uh, the entitlements, the SLAs and the products, but in interacting with those customers. 24 seven, can you just imagine the scale of what a five person or a 10 person company can do? You can literally service thousands and hundreds of thousands of people if you have a well-defined chat bot. And again, nothing too complex here. Start with a simple PDF manual or an FAQ. That is the perfect multi uh, shot prompt interface. So we've talked about prompt engineering you really, you know, what I would do if I were to sit down with a team for even half a day is, you know, for this to scale infinitely, if you, if you put the best practices in there, version control, code repository, template driven, grounding these bots in one-to-one, -one, if you have a, re a review and approval process for these prompts, uh, start in the sandbox. The great thing about flows is they are all chain set deployable, so you can move from sandbox to production very easily. And uh, Apex, I love Apex. Um, you know, there there is still programming invo involved, um, and I would not say that AI makes the need for code obsolete, but it makes the need you know GPT can generate the code. So all of our interfaces we actually make available. Um, through Apex. So we've been playing a lot with these building blocks, which is an a AI completion action. You build a request, you establish some system context, act, act as a language translator. Uh, here's the user message, hello world. Uh, invoke the, uh, the actual um, completion. <clears throat> then we get a response back. So we go ahead and run this. And in our logs, we'll take a look at the debug. You can see through Apex, we have a hello world and we got back and <clears throat> looks like Latin Salve Mundus. So um, agile methodologies are necessarily going to evolve along with AI. I personally use extreme programming. There's a variety of uh, methodologies. The important thing to point out is it is very iterative. You start initially with defining and aligning what you want to accomplish. You start very simple with completions. You build and deploy those completions. You interact with them to understand them. You look at your transcripts in step four. And how, how are these dialogues actually progressing? You learn from it and you iterate and you promote some of these things to automation. 
and you go from one completion and then you add two or three, the pr pretty soon you're getting into complex orchestrations. You're having AI assistance updating fields in real time as customers uh, express escalation or any sort of trigger points. So the, the need for an app lifecycle is, is definitely there. And um, while I would encourage everyone to build things, I also recognize that um, you know, eventually as we get through this trough of disillusionment and productivity, people are gonna want an app store. They're gonna want these AIs pre-built. We are actively working on an app store for AIs bundled with the necessary PDF templates and the room templates to do end-to-end -end, um, customer interactions. And so a couple uh, last minute thoughts. Um, we are really at the crossroads um, in matrix terms. You know, if you take the red pill, you're gonna go all in on AI. If you take the the, the blue pill, uh, you know, it's not necessarily making a decision. It might just be deferring making a decision. And when you get into these red pill kind of decisions, you are gonna be confronted with security, as we talked about earlier. There's potentially cannibalization of user-based licensing model. Now we're progressing to, you know, what is the right model? Uh, is it usage-based and metering? Is it per bot? Um, there's a lot to explore. We also have to resist the temptation to do imperative coding and thinking that humans can just write if statements all day on expert systems. AI can actually take everything in your CRM system. You have marketing working on lead collection. You have SDRs working. You have support reps. You have a whole customer 360. If every single department were to impose their own silo or their view on a customer, you'll end up with a very one-dimensional customer relationship. And the great thing about AI is that you know, we have reached this point of diminishing returns with declarative and imperative coding. And now we, we have the luxury of taking a step back and, and feeding AI the data and letting it produce suggested content. And finally, you know, we're, we're, we're going to get into more customer self-service with AI with humans in the loop. It's, just a, it's a whole new way of thinking about your processes. Uh, if you've made it this far, thank you very much. Um, we went a little bit over 45 minutes. We're at about uh, the 48-minute mark. Some next steps. Uh, Mark Good at AIForceTraining.com goes much, much deeper into the case flow examples and the completions and does uh, an excellent job. He's an excellent trainer and coach. And there's also materials, self-study, self-paced. Um, they've done a great job. Our own website, idialog.app, um, you can get access to the App Exchange app. Uh, we also provide some AI training more around conversational AI and uh, end to end architecture with AI and pro services. And so um, I would say we, we need more people like Mark Good who have a, a passion for this. Um, and it was self service and access to free AI and models. Um, and myself, I you know, probably would not have even adopted Salesforce had they not provided a free developer edition and you can get hands on with this. So in the spirit of that, our intent is to offer free AI development uh, orgs for everyone. You can email me or us at info at app, and we will provide that today. Just mention you, you saw this within the, the GPT Dreaming Conference or this video. And uh, we are transitioning more towards, um, 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 so Microsoft has actually donated the OpenAI credits that we're giving away for free. There's a daily limit. But we're transitioning to bring your own API key model so you can actually manage your spend um, when you're demoing and building these models. So with that, uh, thank you very much for your time and reach out to me for more information. Thank you.